How many of you write when you write in longhand when you have something to write? How many of you print? Mm -hmm. You don't know whether you print or you what? You think they'll do a mix? Uh huh. I'm very interested in uh, technologies of language, of which uh, writing systems stand out. Uh, although, uh, after some in time, in modern times, the uh, reproduction of language, uh, of spoken language, becomes uh, of equal or, or if not of greater importance. What intrigues me about writing systems is the, uh, the degree to which a body of uh, culture, let us call it, uh, does or does not make it across a transition point between two different writing systems. Uh, let, let me give you an example. In the 1920s, uh, the Turkish government, uh, being a nationalist, secular government, decided to abandon the Arabic script, which had been used to write Turkish for the preceding, um, you know, uh, ten centuries or so. The act was seen as a act of uh, modernizing Turkey, uh, but you could also see it as an act that uh, cut off Turks. From their, uh, from their written heritage. If you no longer learned the Arabic uh, script, uh, you could not read anything that was written, uh, say, before 1920 in your own language unless it happened to be transliterated into, uh, into the new script. And this had... Uh, interesting uh, implications. I became very aware of this the first time I went to Turkey in 1965. Uh, I was in a uh, hotel in central Turkey and talking to some people and it became apparent that I knew Arabic and people would come up to me and say, could you write my name in Arabic script? Because I've never seen what my name looks like. Uh, in Arabic script. So I would write it and then and give it to them on a little bit piece of paper. Then they would take it across the street to the antique dealer to find out whether I had done it right. Now of course the antique dealer could have done it by himself but he wasn't going to spend all day just writing out things in, in Arabic script for people. But the, 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 uh, the satisfaction that these older people gained from seeing their name written as it once had been uh, just struck me as being uh, very, very touching in a way. But I also did a study of, uh, of Turkish names in general. What names do Turks give their children? And prior to, um, let's say prior to 1839, uh, most boy children were named, that is by most I mean about a third of all male children, were named either Mohammed or Ahmed, or the Turkish pronunciations of those names, or named for a member of the family of Ali, either Ali, Hassan, or Hussein. Uh, gradually that shifted as the uh, empire became modernized, and people gave their boy, children, a much wider variety of names. But all the names they gave them were in Arabic. Because uh, when you use the Arabic script, 
one of the peculiarities of it is that it has no capital letters. And therefore, you can't tell what a name is if you're relying upon uh, capitalization to identify a name for you. And Arabic has lots and lots of words that are not, would not have been known to Turks in general. So the safe thing was to give someone a name that looked like a name so that when you ran across it, you would say, oh, that is a name. Uh, that is to say it is not like, you know, Tishan or Keisha or some name that wasn't used in the 19th century uh, for us now. Uh, it would look like a name. Then as soon as you got to the point where young Turks were being taught their language in Roman letters instead of Arabic letters, you had a, an explosion of new names that had never been used before by anybody. Uh, because they used short vowels that could be expressed in Roman characters. They could have a capital letter, and uh, therefore you had a completely new name, so that you had names like um, uh, Errol, uh, Oral, uh, things that never occurred in Turkish before. And this became characteristic of Turkey, is that Turks have names now that are dramatically different from the names in the Arab world or the names in Iran. Whereas at one time they had names that were almost indistinguishable from, uh, from Iranian names or Arabic names. And of course one of the results is that uh, Turks uh, using a Roman script that is used in Europe that contributes to a feeling of affinity with Europe that has become politically important uh, in the quest of Turkey to become part of the European Union. When you change the, the technology, on the one hand you cut people off from a, uh, from a previous technology because they become dependent on only those segments of that technology that make it across a barrier uh, of technological change. Uh, but you also open up new possibilities because the new technology may, uh, may create a linkage in some direction that was not previously apparent. So that now, um, uh, you know, you have a striking difference if you go to Turkey and you look around, all signs are in Roman uh, script and you go to the older buildings and the old graveyards and you see the old Arabic script and you realize that's, you know, what a huge, uh, what a huge uh, step that was. And I think much, a much bigger step than was anticipated at the time. Uh, the great question that we have now, of course, is whether the internet uh, will be a, um, a transition point of that sort. As people stop actually going to the library and reading books, uh, and indeed as libraries stop buying books, and as books are being published, uh, will books become uh, uh, irrelevant, except insofar as they get uh, uh, converted, get digitized, so that they're available uh, online. And of course, you look at projects uh, like the one that Google has established and put uh, books online, and you realize, well, those books are English language. Uh, they aren't necessarily in a variety of European languages. And you wonder, will the technologies that are made available to us now uh, end up uh, cutting off our ability to have access to earlier culture? Uh, even now, um, most people would avoid reading old handwritings, like from two or three hundred years ago. 
uh, as long as handwriting really was a universally taught skill and that people were quite schooled in both in the writing and in the reading of handwriting, uh, the idea of, of going to the uh, correspondence or the commercial records of, uh, of several hundred years ago uh, was not that daunting. Nowadays, it has become more and more daunting. We always think, of course, that the invention of the printing press changed everything. But of course, it only changed those things that were printed. And almost all writing continued to be done by hand uh, down until uh, the 20th century. Uh, it's just that um, those things that were printed as books or pamphlets and newspapers were the ones that were uh, using the new technology. And that's another point that I want to make here, and that is that the change in a technology may seem to have a, uh, a certain critical point. You say, well, Gutenberg invented the printing press with movable type at a certain point. Therefore, that is when we begin talking about the print era. Uh, but you could also make an argument that the print era uh, came in very, very, very slowly. Uh, and that most of the, uh, of the communication and most of the cultural uh, uh, contributions for another one, two, three hundred years uh, were made uh, without benefit of the printing press. So we tend to, on the one hand, I think, overread specific dates and say give them more emphasis than they, uh, than they deserve. And we tend to understate uh, the importance of the changes that we have a difficult time in dating. The, uh, there were two writings, well, basically there are three writing systems in the ancient Middle East. In Egypt, you had a writing system of uh, pictograms, uh, and that writing system comes to an end uh, in the uh, era after Alexander the Great who died in 323. That is to say, in the Hellenistic era, we uh, classically begin in 323. Uh, the the, the uh, hieroglyphic system uh, becomes supplanted so that the written language of the Coptic church, the Christian church of Egypt, uh, is written in an alphabet derived from the Greek alphabet rather than an alphabet that is descended from the ancient uh, hieroglyphic tradition. In Mesopotamia, you had cuneiform writing, I say writing made with wedge-shaped marks, uh, where you had the, um, a stylus pressed into a soft clay tablet, uh, which then could be baked and be made permanent, so that we have you know, about a gazillion of these tablets uh, left. Uh, the last cuneiform uh, tablet that we know of dates apparently from 75 AD or 75 CE. Uh, it, it was a tradition that, that disappeared. In time, as in the case of the Greek hieroglyphics, nobody knew how to read anything in cuneiform writing or hieroglyphic writing. The knowledge disappeared. So it becomes a technology that could not be, uh, be reanimated. Um, sort of like, you know, you have a disk that was saved on a, uh, you know, on a five inch floppy on a Texas Instruments PC of 35 years ago, and where in the world are you ever going to find a machine that will read that, that disc? I mean, you have the disc, you know there's something on it, you can't hold it up to the light and see what it says, 
uh, you have to have somebody who has access to or personally knows of the right technology. So what you have uh, in the late ancient world in the Near East is the disappearance, uh, gradual to be sure, but the disappearance of two of the historic uh, techniques of writing, and with it the disappearance of everybody who could understand what was written uh, in those technologies, a little bit like those, um, you know, those Turks who wanted to see their name written in the old form but couldn't read it themselves. The third technology was the alphabet. Uh, the alphabet, you could argue, supplanted both of the earlier technologies. Uh, but this, of course, you know, requires that you understand what is meant by an alphabet. An alphabet was a series of characters that represented uh, in a single character either a consonant or, uh, in particular, a long vowel. Uh, it is um, uh, attributed to the Phoenicians, was attributed to the, to the Phoenicians, uh, in ancient times by the Greeks to say that they got their alphabet from the Phoenicians. Uh, it apparently is, uh, has parallels in uh, a Semitic language that is of that era that did not use the marks but used cuneiform to indicate the same sort of thing which would be uh, alphabetic cuneiform, the Ugaritic language. Uh, of, of Lebanon, uh, but basically this notion of a, of a limited number of characters, uh, you know, 20-some, came to be used by everybody in one By everybody, I mean it spreads way beyond the hearth land of the Middle East, it shows up in India, it shows up in Central Asia, shows up in Mongolia, uh, shows up in Europe. Uh, it was a, a, a good system. Uh, the Greeks are often credited with perfecting the system by creating a series of, um, of letters that were short vowels so that you could express, you could write down both the short vowel and the long vowel. And that made it supposedly more complete. Although, uh, if you text something today, you realize that you do not need to put down all of those letters. And uh, the Arabs and the uh, Hebrews and so forth have long realized you don't have to put down all those letters. Uh, you know, the Greeks invented um, you know, a way to clutter up the page, perhaps. Um, but uh, the question is whether it was really necessary or not. There are certainly crucial points where you want to know whether you have a long vowel or a short vowel, but not very often. But anyway, uh, the Greeks get credited with this um, stunning invention of the short vowels. Uh, and uh, Greek becomes, uh, the Greek alphabet becomes widely spread, but a more widely spread alphabet is the, uh, is the Aramaic. Uh, Aramaic uh, the Aramaic alphabet, which is derived more from the Hebrew alphabet um, uh, than from the Greek, uh, becomes spread throughout uh, most of the Middle East other than, than Egypt uh, and then spreads eastward into Iran and, and points east. And it's very adaptable um, and is used for many, many uh, different languages and various shapes from the Aramaic alphabet uh, get used for, uh, 
for versions of the alphabet dedicated to, uh, to specific languages. If you take Old Mongolian and you turn it on its side, it looks like Aramaic, for example. At least that's what Mongolian specialists say. Because it, it comes from Aramaic. Now, the reason I'm going on about this is because I want to talk about Hellenism. Hellenism is a word that is used to, uh, to characterize a wide variety of political and cultural uh, phenomena that are associated with the period uh, following the death of Alexander the Great uh, and being uh, commonplace within the region that Alexander conquered uh, from Egypt across to the Indus Valley of Pakistan. Uh, there's a lot of debate over Hellenism. A lot of scholarship has gone into, uh, on the one hand, trying to show the enormous variety and uh, uh, penetration of Hellenism of the Greeks and then a lot of scholarship gone and devoted to proving that that isn't so and the question of uh, Hellenism is a is a question that from a world historical point of view is rather interesting, not only in and of itself, but in relation to uh, later periods of history when you get into, say, imperial eras where the language of a uh, conquering uh, state or uh, a state that becomes an imperial overlord in one or another fashion uh, becomes a vehicle for culture. In other words, the study of Hellenism. Um, you could connect to the, uh, to the study of the use of English in India. Um, uh, you know, Englishism or something like that, um, Anglicism. Uh, you know, you'd say, who, who uses English in India? Is it, what, what is the class implication? What are the purposes of it? Uh, how does it relate to other languages? All these questions that arise with the use of English uh, in India today uh, are parallel to questions that arose uh, or to phenomena that arose uh, in the era, era, era of Hellenism. And the same questions as to what does it mean and why is it that way? And of course, as in the case of the invention of printing press by Gutenberg, this is all dated specifically to the, uh, the death of Alexander. Uh, well, first of all, the, the date of Alexander's death doesn't have much to do at least uh, outside the realm of politics. After Alexander died, you had a division of his empire among certain of his generals. Uh, the two most important of, for the purposes of talking about Hellenism uh, are a general named Ptolemy, uh, who took over in Egypt, and a general named Seleucus, who took over in uh, Iraq and Iran. Uh, in both cases, families continue to, at least in the heart of their respective, until the Romans uh, uh, came in uh, and deposed the last of the Seleucids. They are kind of awkward to study and 
the Ptolemaic dynasty, most of the kings are Ptolemy, and most of the queens are named Cleopatra, a uh, lover of the homeland. Um, uh, in the case of the Seleucids, uh, they're either named Seleucus or Antiochus. And so the two capital cities uh, dynasty were Seleucia, which is basically you know, on the outskirts of what is today Baghdad. Uh, or Antioch which is today a city in northern uh, uh, in northern Syria. Uh, for the Ptolemies, they ruled from one city, which they uh, developed as as their great capital, and that was the city of Alexandria. So there is an association between these uh, these generals. Reputation of respective capital cities. Hellenization or Hellenism is often associated with of cities that were by Alexander, one of his uh, one of his successors. Uh, uh, and cities that had a garrison made up of either Greeks or Macedonians, Macedonians of Alexander from the region just north of uh, And therefore, it said, well, you put down uh, of Greeks or Macedonians, or mixed Greeks and Macedonians, and you put down these colonies all the way from uh, from India, or northern Afghanistan at least, across to Egypt, and these become uh, sort of, um, I don't like to use the word, word cancer, but, uh, but they become, uh, you know, growing nodules, and that, uh, <laughs> spread out from them and are best represented by them. Uh, which creates a certain model of, of historical change. Uh, a model of historical change that was uh, very riveting, I think, for historians in the 18th and 19th centuries when the Europeans were creating cities and populating them by uh, by colonies uh, from the homeland. And some of those cities, of course, became great metropolises. And we're all now living in one of them, a great malignant uh, growth that started with some Dutch settlers a long, long time ago. And then it just what big malignancies do. Um, so you can, you, you can say, well, Hellenization uh, is in some ways akin to modernization, to the spread around the world of the notion and the institutions and the world uh, outlook of modernity that begins in Europe or Europe and America and becomes implanted uh, throughout the world uh, primarily starting in, in important cultural centers or centers that are recognized as points of dissemination of new thoughts. This, this notion of dissemination of cultural change through, uh, through uh, nodes that are nodes of expansion has been studied fairly uh, Scientifically, by by geographers, and uh, Hellenization and uh, uh, modernity, or and the imperial enterprise in places like India, provide 
plausible examples. But as I say, the, this date of Alexander isn't necessarily a very, uh, a very one. Uh, Herodotus, who's writing uh, a couple of hundred years before Alexander, uh, when there had been no Greek conquest in the, uh, in the Middle East, although you did have Greek cities in what is now Turkey, those were cities established for a long time by, uh, by settlers. He tells a story of a king of the Scythians. Now the Scythians were uh, pastoral nomads who lived uh, north of the Black Sea and extending over to the area that now would be in the southern uh, you know, Muslim Republic, so the former Soviet Union, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. These are people who were uh, horsemen, horse herders. They had uh, homes that were uh, portable. In other words, you would have a, uh, you know, a wagon bed and you would put your, your hut on it and you would move around to suit the motions of your animals so forth, and the language that they spoke, while distantly related to Greek, uh, was certainly not understandable to the Greeks or, or vice versa. So here you have a, a, a Scythian king, his name is Scylus. And here's what Herodotus said. Uh, Aryapathes, the Scythian king, had several sons, among them this Scylus who was the child not of a native Scythian, but a woman of Istria. Istria is the area along the, uh, the eastern shore of the Adriatic Sea, what would now be uh, Croatia or uh, Albania, somewhere in that area. So this king out here in, in Central Asia has a wife who is from, uh, who's from the Adriatic area. She herself taught Scylus to speak and read Greek. Sometime afterwards, Areopathes, I note that this name Areopathes, the area part is Arian, just to reflect back on what I was talking about last time. Uh, sometime afterwards, Areopathes was treacherously slain by Spargopathes, king of the Agathir, Agathersoi. Whereupon Scylus succeeded to the throne and married the wife of his father, whose name was Opoia. Now, the wife of his father, of course, is not his mother because his father obviously had uh, more than one uh, wife or concubine. Uh, this Opoia was a Scythian by birth, and Areopathes had a son by her called Oricus. So now he's married to his father's widow and he has a half-brother who is a genuine Scythian, whereas he is only half Scythian and half Istrian. During his reign over the Scythians, as he disliked the Scythian mode of life and was much more attached by his upbringing to Greek traditions, he used to act as follows. Whenever he brought the army of the Scythians to the town of the, of the Boristhanites, who claimed to be of Greek origin, exactly where this town is, I don't know. Uh, he used to leave the army in the suburbs, and having entered the walls by himself and carefully closed the gates, took off his Scythian dress and put on Greek costume. And in this attire, he used to walk about the marketplace without guards or retinue. They guarded the gates that none of the Scythians might see the king thus apparelled. Scylus, meanwhile, lived exactly as the Greeks and offered sacrifices to the gods according to Greek rites. Often a month or more would pass before he would change back into his Scythian clothes and depart. This he did repeatedly and built himself a house in Borosthenes and married a wife who was a native of the place for this. 
But when the time came that was ordained to bring him to harm, getting to fate here, um, the occasion of his ruin was the following. He wanted to be initiated into the rites of the Bacchic Dionysus, the Greek god of uh, wine and uh, fun. Um, and was on the point of obtaining initiation into the rites when a very great prodigy occurred. He had in the city of the Baristhanites a house of great extent and erected at vast cost, round which stood a number of sphinxes and griffins carved in white marble. Onto this the god cast a thunderbolt. It burnt to the ground. In spite of this, however, Scylus carried through the initiation ceremony. Now the Scythians criticize the Greeks for their Bacchic rites. They say it is not reasonable to imagine there is a god who impels men to madness. No sooner, therefore, was Scylus initiated in the Bacchic rites than one of the Baristhanites went to the Scythian saying, you Scythians laugh at us because we rave during these rites of Dionysus, uh, and the god possesses us. But now this daimon, this is the god possessing uh, the believer, but now this daimon has seized upon your king too, and he raves like us and is maddened by the god. If you disbelieve me, come with me and I will show you. The chiefs of the Scythians went with the man, and the Baristhanite took them secretly to a tower. Presently, Scylus passed by with the band of revelers, and the Scythians saw him raving in the back state. Um, they regarded the matter as a very great misfortune. They departed and told the whole army what they had witnessed. When, therefore, after this, Scylus was at home again, the Scythians put themselves under the protection of his brother uh, uh, and rose in rebellion against Scylus. Now, this text has been taken as a, and, and reasonably so, as a model example of Hellenism, of Hellenization, of non-Greeks becoming so enamored of the culture and life of the Greeks that they dress like the Greeks, they carry out religious rituals like the Greeks, and they get drunk and rave like the Greeks. Um, but of course this happens a couple of hundred, year, hundred years before Alexander the Great. So the, you know, this is one, that there are many examples of the degree to which uh, an attachment to Greek culture uh, arises well before the invasions of Alexander and continues uh, thereafter. Of course, the continuation is then attributed to the cities that he established and to the generals uh, who established dynasties to rule from those cities. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the Greeks' uh, culture or divine right, rights or costume had already attracted many people uh, before that. Um, so Hellenization appears to be a gradual process that is punctuated in the middle by an invasion that comes to be uh, taken as its point of initiation. And this fits into the idea that uh, the uh, spread of Greek ideas in Greek culture was a result of a uh, military conquest that brought uh, new and better and more, um, uh, more elegant cultural traits to the old Middle East, whether it was Egypt, or Lebanon, or Mesopotamia, or Iran. Uh, this construction of Hellenization uh, was very appealing, as I say, to historians uh, from Europe uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries who could see it as a, uh, as a kind of a model of what imperialism was uh, doing uh, in their own world. 
where you could conquer a land and say afterwards that you have brought a much higher culture to the land. The fact that in many cases everybody who was there when you conquered them died, um, you can say, well, we brought a higher culture to the real estate that they are buried in or something like that. Because in places like the Caribbean, all of the native population uh, died in the islands of the Caribbean. Um, still, there was something particularly mesmerizing about the, uh, this Hellenistic history, very different from the Roman history, uh, which I don't want to get into now, but as we'll see, uh, as you'll see next week when you do um, the reading for next week, uh, where the Romans went, their language did not follow, and their customs did not follow. In some areas they did, but in many areas they didn't. And indeed, it is more common to think of Rome as a Hellenistic kingdom than to think of the areas ruled by Rome as uh, totally subservient to Roman, uh, to Roman culture. Because Hellenism is seen uh, somehow as a higher and grander uh, expression of civilization. Uh, archaeologically, one of the strongest manifestations of this was the excavation in the 1970s by a site in northern Afghanistan uh, called Ai Hanum. Uh, that site uh, is described by the excavators as essentially a Greek city. Physically, it has all of the manifestation, all the manifestations of a Greek city, and the art of Ai Hanum is, uh, you know, Greek art. It simply happens to be Greek art that is being made in uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the, the rulers of northern Afghanistan after Alexander were not the Seleucids because the Seleucids, while they had ruled the eastern territories, never had control of northern Afghanistan. That was a separate kingdom known as Bactria. Uh, and the rulers of Bactria uh, claimed Greek or Macedonian background, and if you ever get into the study of ancient coinage, one of the great glories of ancient coinage uh, consists of the Greek, of the, the, the coins from, from uh, you know, Greek Bactria. Large coins with magnificent um, detailed portraits of, of the rulers. Uh, so there's no question about that, that Greek art spread to Ai Hanum. And it is also fairly clear that uh, in the course of time, the artists of Ai Hanum or other places in Afghanistan uh, became drawn into the circle of people who were following a new religion that starts up around 500 BC or so, and that's the religion of Buddhism. So you find that the earliest Buddhist images, the earliest images of the Buddha or of followers of the Buddha uh, appear to be Greek and in some cases are almost indistinguishable from Greek art. Uh, this takes place in the um, western, sort of the northwestern part of Pakistan, which is now basically a no-go zone um, because you get killed, but um, it's the area around Peshawar, which uh, which was known in ancient times as Gandhara. Yeah. Sorry, I think it's in is in present-day Afghanistan. It's in the no it's northeast of the city of Mazar Sharif in northern Afghanistan, near the Oxus River, which forms the boundary between Afghanistan and Tajikistan in that area. 
Um, the, the, the city of Mazar Sharif, which is the metropolis of northern Afghanistan, is the modern form of the medieval city of Balkh, which is a uh, derives from the ancient uh, term Bactria that goes back to the Hellenistic era. So you have a lot of continuity there. So here you have a story about a Scythian king who's from Central Asia. And here you have an archaeological site dealing with um, northern Afghanistan. And you see the art influences going into, uh, into Pakistan and laying the foundations, basically, of um, Buddhist art and, to some degree, of Indian art altogether. You don't have that much before this time, although you do have a certain number of uh, images on seals from the Indus Valley and so forth, but I don't have to talk about those. So you say, OK, the, the argument that Hellenism spread far and wide through the empire of Alexander, uh, even if it started before the conquests, it surely was promoted by the establishment of these cities and by the governance of these generals and their descendants who succeeded uh, Alexander. Um, but is that, you know, what, do you, what do you prove from that? Uh, to some degree, uh, let's, let's say one test case was what happened in Mesopotamia. Babylon is one of the cities that's conquered by Alexander. It's just west of where Baghdad is today and therefore just west of where Seleucia was in the period of Alexander's successors. Uh, a very key point in, in Iraq where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers run most closely together so that you can move easily by canal from one river to another. Babylon is on the Euphrates River, which is the mo further to the west, and Seleucia and subsequently Baghdad is on the Tigris River, which is uh, further to the east. And you might draw inferences as to whether the rulers of Babylon, by being in the Western River, were more interested in Syria and Turkey, places they could reach on the Euphrates and the ones on the Tigris in the east were more interested in Iran. But uh, that, since you can go from one to another by canal, it's not a, a huge point one way or another. Uh, in Babylon, you have uh, rulers, uh, governors appointed by the Greeks, who uh, maintain all uh, appropriate to the gods of Babylon. And documents continue to be written in cuneiform. An even more telling example, or counterexample to Ihanim, is in the city of Uruk, uh, which is one of the ancient cities of Mesopotamia, going, of course, Uruk is where Gilgamesh ruled uh, in Uruk, which is occupied throughout this period. Not a single word of Greek has been found. You know, not an inscription, uh, not an ostracon. An ostracon, by the way, is a uh, is a uh, piece of broken pottery that's been used as a, a solid surface to write on. Uh, nothing. And yet you have a lot of Uruk in the Hellenistic period. And, you know, it has raised a question as the, the people who have talked about the spread of Greek culture have looked at things too selectively whether they have looked at those things that uh, 
that seem to express the, um, uh, the Greek influence um, and then shut their eyes to those things that don't quite fit that model. So you could argue, and indeed uh, there are scholars who have argued, that during the period when the Seleucids are ruling in, uh, in Mesopotamia, in Iraq, um, you really have a continuation of the uh, culture and administration there before Alexander came. This doesn't mean that you do not find some traces uh, of Greek rule because we know that the Greeks did rule. Uh, occasionally you will find people giving their children Greek names. Uh, going back to what I said at the very beginning about Turkish names. Names are a uh, useful uh, device for looking at uh, cultural change. Uh, sometimes you'll find that um, there will be seals that were used to seal a document or seal a parcel or something, and those seals will be using uh, Greek characters. But by and large, it appears that the Babylonian area of central Iraq uh, remains functioning primarily in cuneiform uh, during, this, during this Hellenistic period. Okay. But if that's the case, if, uh, if you're going to have northeast Afghanistan, a pure, seemingly a pure Greek city, whereas in Babylon, um, one of the old central metropolises of the Middle East, uh, you don't have this sort of evidence of Hellenization, then you get the question of what, what's the differential? Why do some places adopt Greek culture and other places don't? Uh, we'll pause now while I think up an answer to that question. Uh, it's a, it, it is a very difficult question and one with, with, with fairly broad ramifications for comparative examples in other times. You know, why does a cultural influence uh, catch on in one area, not in another? Often, people will look to the question of what is the relative standing of the peoples involved? In other words, did Hellenization catch on uh, better in places that were, um, say, had Indo-European linguistic backgrounds? which would cover Afghanistan and Iran, uh, but, not, uh, but not Mesopotamia? Or did it have to do with the Greeks being an urban uh, society and in what cultures that they would call barbarians, like the Scythians, uh, they, were, they just outclassed anything else and the barbarians came running to, uh, to attend to them. Um, Nobody can answer that very well. And Egypt provides a particularly interesting example because the city of Alexandria uh, is on the Mediterranean, is a purely Greek city. It was founded uh, either by Alexander or by Ptolemy the uh, first. It is where they brought Alexander's body to be buried. The body had to be stolen to get it there. Um, it is uh, where you had, uh, we have a lot of information about the organization of Alexandria as a, as a polis, as a uh, Greek city-state. And yet when you look geographically at the assumption that you have, namely that it is at the mouth of the Nile River, is not true. Uh, the Nile is the, uh, the heart of Egypt, flowing from south to north, from uh, East Africa down to the Mediterranean Sea. You would think, okay, have a influential capital. 
to the Nile River. We have contact up to uh, throughout the rest of Egypt. Now, there may have been practical reasons. The mouth of the Nile River is a shifting area where uh, deposits of silt cause the, um, the nature of the river to, to, to shift. Uh, very unsettling, and there have been cities at the mouth of the Nile that, have, that were written about and described at certain points and then have disappeared, like the city of Tunis. And uh, you could have made it closer to the capital of Egypt, northern Egypt, city at the point the Nile Delta begins. That is to say, the Nile flows from south to north, uh, and then it gets down here and forms a delta, uh, and the capital of Egypt was here at the head of the delta. And that was the city of Memphis. Uh, the Ptolemies ruled over Memphis, but they didn't rule from Memphis. And in many respects, Egypt becomes split between a native country that remains, in many respects, profoundly Egyptian and a capital city of the Ptolemaic dynasty that is the most famous center for Hellenism uh, you know, of any point in the ancient world. So Hellenism becomes kind of a, uh, you know, a difficult phenomenon to pin down uh, historically. Uh, certainly the Greek uh, you know, culture spread, although the Greek alphabet did not spread all that far. Most of the alphabets in the East were derived from the Aramaic rather than the Greek, although the Egyptian comes from the Greek. Uh, it affected certain areas more than others. Uh, those areas, in some respects, that had the most entrenched literate cultures somehow maintained a degree of vitality, but over time, uh, that vitality is lost. Over time, the cuneiform culture of Mesopotamia disappears, and the hieroglyphic culture of Egypt uh, disappears. All right, now let me uh, bring up, up a comparison. A comparison I touched on uh, just very briefly last week, or on Tuesday, I guess. And this is what happens in China. Now, what is striking about China, as I mentioned last time, is that you don't get a change in the technology of language. The language that shows up by 1700 BC uh, on the uh, bronze, molded into bronze uh, ritual vessels for the Shang Dynasty, or scratched into bones and tortoise shells uh, in the form of oracle bones, that, that writing system and indeed that language uh, is uh, lineally the ancestor of the Chinese of today. And you never had something like cuneiform versus hieroglyphics versus the alphabet. You just have one. Uh, one system. Uh, the system turns out to be something that could be adapted and eventually was adapted to other languages, in particular to uh, Korean and Japanese in some respects, but, but for China, which is eventually covers an immense territory, although initially was focused in the north, for China, it is primarily the writing system of northern China. Um, now, you don't, you know, when you have a spread of a Chinese cultural mindset, 
it doesn't become associated so much with the language uh, as with a particular school of thought uh, of Confucianism. So that you have particular texts and particular um, uh, principles that spread uh, eventually over time throughout China, uh, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. Uh, I'm going to talk more next week about, uh, about Confucianism and, and early China. I'm just drawing the comparison here with, uh, uh, with Hellenism. Uh, Hellenism, to some degree, is associated with There's a famous battle at a certain point that is fought where a Roman general thinks that he is going to defeat the Persians, and he finds that there are way, way too many Persians, and he ends up getting defeated. His head is cut and put in a sack, and it's carried up to a place where the Persian king uh, in Armenia, and the head is thrown out on the stage uh, and held up by an actor who, who quotes a line from a Greek play about how the, the, the prey has been caught by the hunter. And, you know, it's Armenia, it's a Persian king, but they still quote it in Greek. Uh, so you do have texts that, are, that come to be known. Um, but not so many. I mean, it, Hellenism becomes more known a, uh, a melting pot of religions, philosophies, and uh, you know worldviews than it is for having one uh, worldview or one philosophy or one religion that is being imposed everywhere. So that when um, the word usually used is syncretism, Hellenistic syncretism. The tendency, you know, this is like, you know, concrete and sin means together. So this is the, the uh, concreting together of, of different things. A god in Egypt will be identified as being the same god as a god in Greece. And a god in Iran will be identified as being the same as some other god uh, in Greece. So that all of the Greek uh, religious legends become uh, you know, blended with those in the, uh, in, in the area that is subjected to Hellenization. Uh, you get the same thing in other areas of, in more concrete areas of knowledge. Uh, Hellenistic uh, science is considered to be a, uh, a terribly important uh, episode of science. Aspects of it. A lot of it comes from Mesopotamia, particularly in the area of, of astronomy. From, from other areas. It isn't simply something that originated with the Greeks. And in point of fact, most of the major Hellenistic thinkers um, don't come from Greece. They may come from a Greek background, but they come from a variety of places. Um, so you end up with a, syn a syncretic uh, culture. Greek literature which we now uh, extol as sort of the core of, of Greek culture, because you have the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, then you have Greek drama, uh, to a lesser extent, Greek poetry. Greek literature doesn't travel well, even though there was this, you know, this performance in Armenia where the 
the defeated general's head was thrown, uh, the, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey don't get translated into local languages. Um, the uh, Greek drama, we have, we have theaters that show up archaeologically and presumably had Greek dramas performed in them, but Greek drama does not get translated into, uh, into local languages. So you end up with a rather selective filter that some aspects of things that are closely associated with Greece get uh, transferred into the areas that are, that are thought of as Hellenized or subjected to Hellenization, and other, uh, other things do not. Uh, why this is the case is really um, never, never been uh, explained very well. Uh, why do some things work, transfer better, more readily, more, have more enthusiastic uh, reception than others? To some, sometimes it is associated with a Greek institution that you have in these cities, and that is the gymnasium. Uh, a gymnasium uh, was a the characteristic school for young Greek men, for, for Greek boys, uh, where they uh, combined athletic uh, exercise with a certain amount of learning and with, uh, you know, this is the root for nakedness because all of the uh, athletics would be performed, uh, would be carried out in the nude. Um, prior to Alexander, the gymnasium as an institution does not appear to be all that, uh, all, all that numerous or that uh, influential because of many other, uh, probably much of Greek education was not mediated through this particular type of school. But in the Hellenistic period, the gymnasium is spread to, uh, to all of these Greek cities uh, and it becomes a education not just for the Greek or Macedonian background but also for the elites of those, of those cultures. So it's seen as a mechanism for the of Greek culture because you can have an Babylonian or an Iranian uh, son of a chief who, um, who goes to a gymnasium and becomes uh, Hellenized. Uh, it's not that when the British uh, Empire parts of the world in the 19th century, uh, one of the things that was often done was to set up a school for the sons of chiefs so that you would um, have a school that was not open to anyone. It was only open for the elite. And the chiefs, sons of chiefs um, were And if they did well, they could go off and get a law degree and go back and overthrow the crown or something, but um, but the idea was that if you if the sons of the chiefs are are influenced, that will be uh, that will be enough. Um, you know, I was thinking of Gandhi and talking about the sort of a chief's son who goes to England, gets a law degree, and goes back and overthrows the crown. But I might equally take in our own Edward Said who goes to a British elite school in, uh, in Cairo uh, over here to become a illustrious professor and then comes up with a philosophy meant to undermine the imperialism that set up the school that he, that he went to. It's uh, kind of a repeating, kind of, a, kind of neat really. Uh, you, 
Greek culture was mediated these gymnasia, or whether this is firmed up is, uh, is hard to determine. But certainly, in time, all this was toward religion in the late ancient uh, world, uh, particularly Christianity. Um, and ultimately, in the question of who, you know, who are the heirs of the Hellenistic era, uh, this is a debate we'll get into. I'll, I'll outline more when I talk about Islam. But one of the things to keep in mind is that point has been made by scholars about how the great achievements of the Hellenistic era were transmitted from Greek into Arabic and then Arabic into Latin. They became the intellectual basis of, uh, of the great intellectual um, uh, development of Europe uh, from the 12th, 13th century onward. You go from Greek to Arabic to Latin to us. And it's thought, you know, how nice But it's taken for granted that that's a natural thing. After all, anyone who who uh, who has contact with Aristotle will want to, two of his works, will want to translate them into his language, because hey, it's Aristotle, it's the world's most boring writer. Um, but when you look at those Arabs, the works of Aristotle with Arab commentaries available to them, and they went to India. No one in India copied. Aristotle. When they went to China. Nobody in China copied Aristotle. Um, they are, or you can say this about the medical works of Galen, a uh, Roman uh, medical writer. Uh, from the point of view of the Indians, the Chinese, he said, thank you, we already have our philosophy. Thank you, we already have our medical system. It was only the Europeans uh, who, I, maybe they just realized that they didn't know much of anything. Um, but also, I think it was more that they felt that somehow that they were natural heirs of these texts, that they should translate Aristotle somehow this was part of the story they had invented for themselves of what European origins were. So this is a it is a, a period of of dramatic change when you think of the termination of the hieroglyphic and the cuneiform cultures of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, but it is not nearly as uh, neat a package as the term Hellenism uh, tends to, to convey. Uh, the transfer is not consistent, it is not complete, and it is um, ambiguously related to specific Greek institutions. And that gets to the point of saying, well, where, you know, what is the long-term influence of this Hellenism other than in the sort of mythos of, uh, of Western history? So I'll stop there. Next week, I'm, we're going to deal with the Romans and the Chinese dynasties. I'll try and think of something for you to read or think about.